All right. Good evening, everybody. My name's Colm. Uh, I work at Amazon Web Services. And um, I'm here today to talk about um, something I'm pretty passionate about, which is AWS and confidentiality. And how we at AWS and how customers using AWS can operate and run services that you know, obviously involve data, but in ways where although the software and systems might have access to and use that data for whatever purpose is intended, um, people and operators and humans don't. And I think this is an increasingly important aspect of how services are run and, how, and a big part of how um, security is thought about these days. It's something I see come up in more and more conversations from customers, their auditors, regulators, and so on. Uh, and so hopefully we've got some really interesting content to share um, about our approach and how customers can uh, use the same techniques um, to help secure their data um, for their customers and users. So I wanna just start with some really simple kind of day-to-day -day examples of this in action. So if you call AWS support, right, if you've got some issue with a service, you know, you're trying to figure out how to do something and you need some help, um, the folks at AWS support live for that. They just love helping people, right? That is, that is their core of every single day. They're just trying to figure out, you know, how can we make it easier and easier for people to use systems and whatever queries they're coming in with, how can we uh, help them as quickly as possible? Now, when I started in the industry, long before I joined AWS, it was pretty common for technical companies, you know, their support desk or their IT staff or their systems administrators would just kind of have carte blanche access to everything, right? They would just have these, you know, root access accounts or whatever, and they could just go, you know, fix things for customers. They could just go, oh, let me look at that for you now and, you know, see, see what we can do and uh, twill, twill some knobs and yay, the customer's day is, uh, is a bit happier. But that really isn't how things work anymore, isn't how things can operate because um, it, that would involve way too much trust, way too much access to data, you know, no one is really comfortable with that uh, so much anymore in the modern world. So when you contact AWS support, you know, they don't have some secret insider level of access uh, that customers aren't aware of. You know, they can, um, customers have to grant uh, any, ex grant explicitly any permissions and privileges that they'd like the support team to, you know, do something on their behalf. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you, wanted, say, somebody from AWS support to be able to help you, you know, look at some data or uh, look at what's going on in EC2 instance and so on. Um, well, firstly, they generally would never be comfortable with that. That's something um, they don't typically do for, for all the reasons we just covered. But they would, you'd have to give them access just like you'd have to give anybody else access through the normal uh, mechanisms and processes, you know, adding a role or adding an account and, uh, for, you know, doing it that way. And that's very, very, very intentional. Um, all of the access, in fact, all the access that AWS support do have, we describe it in something um, called a managed policy where we regularly publish, like, here's all of the access uh, for things that they are able to see, which is typically things like, you know, metadata and, and uh, config, you know, configuration data and things that are directly meaningful to helping customers, but are not, um, you know, sensitive data. Uh, and even there, customers have the ability to block or deny that access um, if, if need be. So that's just one example. Another example is the AWS Nitro system. So this is a system I work on. I'm an engineer, I work on EC2. And I work on virtualization and cryptography um, as part of the EC2, you know, the AWS Nitro system, which is the modern platform we built. I'll talk more about it later uh, and how we provide a secure, isolated environment for EC2 instances. And even though, uh, you know, I'm a vice president and distinguished engineer, it's the most senior level we have in EC2. And even though I'm, I've been around uh, a, a while, I've worked at AWS 14 years, uh, you know, I'm, I'm highly trusted with uh, certain 
responsibilities and so on, none of that makes any difference. Like I don't have any kind of special level of access to the Nitro system to be able to go in and figure out, you know, look at a customer's data or see what's going on inside an EC2 instance and so on. The AWS Nitro system is designed as a hermetic system. It's sealed off and I don't get any visibility inside of it. I don't have general operational access or general purpose access of any kind really. And all of that applies even to you know, diagnostic and debug operations, um, which can be a bit of a nuisance, right? If, if you know, we do a lot of testing, we try to build extremely um, high reliability systems, systems that are as perfect as we can be, right? But if we do have some issue that trips in production, because it's some rare case that a you know, customer happens to hit with their workload. You know, I can't just go you know, attach a debugger or get a core dump or something like that. You know? So it's, um, we, and that's very deliberate. That's the way the system has been designed. And all of these are examples of kind of a core cultural attitude, which is that we consider customer data radioactive to us. We don't wanna see it, we don't wanna to touch directly, we want to build shielding material um, so that we can't see or touch it directly, even innocuously, even by mistake. Um, and increasingly, we're giving customers the same tools that we've built internally so that they can have the same benefits for their workloads and reassuring their users that they don't have access to their user data. So I'm gonna get into more detail, but in order to do that, I have to give some disclaimers so that I'm allowed to cover this material. Um, so one disclaimer is a lot of what I'm talking about today can interact with compliance requirements. You know, customers who have compliance requirements from different regulatory authorities and so on. And just one quick reminder that, you know, compliance is a journey. It's always situational and very specific to that situation. And our compliance team are always happy to work with customers on making sure that they can achieve compliance for their specific situations. But, you know, don't um, imagine that everything I'm talking about here is just you know, a cookie cutter that you can take off the shelf and now you've achieved compliance uh, for something or other. It's always a little more complicated than that. And compliance authorities generally like to go really deep, uh, which, we, which we like to see. Um, this talk, because of the nature of the material we're covering, includes kind of movie plot threats, threat, you know, things that are very, very unlikely to occur, but you kind of still have to imagine up when you're um, thinking about your threat modeling. Um, so don't mistake the fact that we've designed for threats with uh, any idea that they're likely. You know, it's just that we like to think about those, uh, those things. And then if you've got more queries um, about our uh, approach to data privacy in general, we've got a data privacy center. You'll find all sorts of material there, including statements from our CISO uh, on our approach to how we handle material um, and, and so on and so forth. There's a wealth of resources there and uh, you'll find all sorts of um, great official statements there too. So those are my disclaimers out of the way. So personally, whenever we're covering anything security related, I always like to start with the threat model. Right? What are we actually defending against? And um, when it comes to this topic about keeping data confidential, confidential um, what we want is defense in depth against bugs and issues in, the, in systems, right? So if there's anything, anything going on inside the software that could end up disclosing data, that's something we want defense against. We also want defense in depth against operational errors and mistakes. You know, you can imagine uh, people running scripts or writing uh, tools and so on that might access data inadvertently. Uh, we wanna have defense against that. And we also want to have defense in depth against untrusted access, including, you know, potentially untrusted insiders, right? Folks, this is like the movie, um, the movie plot threat model, right? Where, you know, maybe somebody's being coerced. You have to imagine these scenarios. Uh, and we want to defend against all of these kinds of things. And, you know, the best kind of defense is to make sure there's no access to the data in the first place. Um, a lot of what this boils down to is, just constantly raising the bar for the principle of least privilege, right? Just really constantly ratcheting down how much access systems and people have to anything. And, and I think our approach to how we do that um, is a little unique. Um, and then integrating 
all access auditing and detective controls into, into all of our processes and our business practices so that if something does go off script, if something is accessed inadvertently, that that is something that is known, right? And that we can build controls around and know how to respond to that. And then integrating strong isolation into our systems. This has been a core aspect of our business from day one. Um, hopefully it's something we're constantly improving, improving on. Um, and whenever we're constantly improving on something, whatever we're constantly trying to ratchet something up, um, it's really important to have ways to measure progress, right? Because we want to be able to see where, you know, where are systems at, uh, how can we drive them to being in a, in a more secure uh, state, and so on. And um, when it comes to this topic, it's not one size fits all. You know, some systems and services just demand higher levels of protection than others. So a simple example is something that handles secret material very directly, right? Like keys or credit card numbers or something like that. Um, you know, we'll typically get a lot more scrutiny and a higher level of protection than something that maybe handles uh, uh, more innocuous data. Um, and we and we want to be able to um, we want to be able to always see how we're doing on those fronts. And so we have this framework. Um, that we've been using to help measure ourselves and figure out, you know, where where is the system and how how can we drive it to the next level and so on. And it's it comes from the principle of least privilege. If you apply, you know, the principle of least privilege all the way down to, you know, what is the absolute minimum level of privilege something should have? Well, it's zero. And so we call it the zero privilege operations framework, where the idea is, you know, we want to get systems uh, and businesses and people in general into an environment where they just have zero privilege to, to be able to access data, where it's just not needed as um, a routine matter to be able to operate and run those systems, right? That's a very high bar uh, and, and appropriately so. Um, and so we've got five levels to this system to help us kind of determine, you know, where what level is the system at and whether that's appropriate. Um, and you can kind of think of it a bit like a maturity framework or, or a systems model, and there are ways this can interact um, with other maturity frameworks and, and systems models. Um, but this, uh, this is what we've been driving and uh, what we use. And so I'm going to cover each of these levels. And as I go through, I'm going to give you examples of what we do with respect to these levels and what customers can do. Um, with, with respect to these levels. But the idea is, you know, level five is more secure than level one and so on. Just keeps going up. So the first level is just foundational principles. And, um, and so one thing we like about this framework uh, is that we, we want to always make it easy to begin. And so level one is really just about accepting as a business, hey, I even want to be in a world where people don't have access to data, right? Because there are some businesses, you know, don't make that decision. They don't feel like it's appropriate for them or they're, they're just not at that level of maturity in their field. Um, but that comes with a lot of implications, right? I think the biggest one is that means, well, as a business, you're kind of making it your responsibility to always ask, what would the customer want us to do with the data? In, in fact, whenever we face um, a dilemma or whenever we face any kind of decision to make, uh, I've, you know, that answer is probably my number one guiding principle. And then the second part that's important is data classification, right? If we're going to take on this matter of, okay, we're going to lock down data, we're going to make sure no one has access to it, um, that generally needs some kind of data classification. We need to decide, well, what is, you know, sensitive data, for example? Right? Is you know, the contents of a file, are, that's easy to say. Well, that's very sensitive. You don't know what it might be. There could be something, uh, something quite risky in there. But maybe some configuration data isn't, or administrative data, or billing data, and so on. And so level one is really about building and starting to classify, OK, what's what? How are you going to be able to think about that? And, uh, and then figuring out, well, how are we going to do this stuff in our business? So, you know, at AWS, it was, it's always been core to us that we just don't want to have access to customer data 
wasn't something we, we had to um, convince a lot of people of. But at the same time, when we're ratcheting up the levels, when we're trying to achieve higher and higher levels of um, security, that can come with temporary inconvenience where maybe old ways of doing things have to be retired and uh, new forms of automation have to be built and so on. And so something we've learned is that in order for that to succeed, it's really important to build uh, feedback mechanisms in your business to just be able to listen to uh, builders and operators and all the folks who might be implicated by or touched by these trade-offs to get their feedback on how well is it going. Because if um, they find it too much of an inconvenience or it's too, too uh, counterproductive, um, it just won't go as quickly as it otherwise would. And uh, we all want to get the results as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, it turns out that, you know, in general, everything we're talking about here of, about ratcheting up the levels involves building more automation, right? So that humans don't have to do things, um, which is good. That's great for operational reasons too. Just taking security off the table for a second. So it's actually a double win if you do it well. Um, there's, there's not too much uh, process wise to achieving level one. Like I said, it's just about accepting the foundational principles. Um, but uh, for classifying data, there are tools and techniques that can help. Um, you know, one uh, is uh, identifying PII is something you can now gonna do in an automated way at scale. Um, Amazon Comprehend, uh, I actually tried this out myself uh, two weeks ago as part of um, uh, preparing this talk and I was pretty staggered because I just pointed at some of my own S3 buckets that I've got um, material in that have just been, you know, just D data I use personally from you know some websites I maintain and so on, mostly mostly Apache web server logs and so on. And um, it was able to do a really good job of just analyzing all that data and telling me, hey, you've got interesting looking things here. This looks like it might be a PII and so on. And you know, it turns out it was just folks trying uh, uh, things against URLs and, and uh, wasn't real um, PII, but it was still very, very useful for me to learn that. And I got a very quick impression of how effective that kind of thing can be at scale. So that's level one. That's um, pretty cut and dry. Level two um, is about, you know, what are the kind of elemental protections we expect in any system? You know, the, the, the kind of table stakes uh, levels of protection um, just for, you know, how it stores data, how that system is accessed and so on. Uh, and, and for us, that's things like, you know, making sure that the physical storage uh, is secure against theft, right? Um, so we're encrypting it at rest and so on. Uh, that we've got network encryption, uh, especially anywhere where network links are in untrusted locations or could be intercepted and so on. Making sure that we've got tested backup and restore processes, right? Which is an increasingly important part of how our customers have to prepare for ransomware uh, and other um, sim similar kinds of attacks. Um, making sure we have secure MFA enabled and that's how we're accessing the systems, you know, so that, you know, inadvertent access isn't as simple as somebody just guessing a password and so on. Um, at AWS, we uh, encrypt. Uh, all of our network uh, traffic links that are outside of our physical control. So everything between an, a an AWS data center, everything between AWS regions, it's all AS-256 encrypted uh, or uses optical layer encryption. Um, and all of the traffic between those data centers, regions, POPs, everything uh, stays on that network. So it all benefits from that encryption. Uh, we've actually got other layers of encryption on top of that too. Um, but at, at every point, we've we've uh, we've got all that, and it's always on. Um, we uh, customers can do all this too. It, it's yeah, we, um, can use at rest encryption with, you know, S3 or Dynamo or EBS. Uh, we've got uh, VPN products. So if you're connecting in uh, to AWS um, to help secure that, uh, whether it's internet connectivity or or over Direct Connect, uh, we've got. AWS VPNs, and we've got VPC encryption. I've got AWS backup to help you with that backup and restore stuff. And, uh, and then we've got MFA uh, in our identity and access management and SSO, which is now called uh, Identity Center and, and Cognito and so on. So no surprises here. Uh, anyone working in security, I don't think will um, 
will be surprised at what we consider kind of table stakes just in terms of elemental protections. Um, the next level I think gets a little bit uh, more interesting because we're starting to get in, in, into things um, that aren't as typical industry-wide but maybe should be, um, and that's to have immutable accountability. Right, to have some kind of accountability mechanisms that make sure you know, all access is recorded in a way that can't just be deleted. Right? Really, really simple examples. Um, and that we're regularly baselining all access. You know, we know who has access to what and why, uh, what those systems have access to and so on. And that we're um, constantly reviewing that and able to you know, just be assured that um, only the right systems do have access uh, to the right material and so on. Um, uh, uh, we never want to have um, anonymous or shared accounts. This is something I see uh, customers do, especially in non-cloud environments, where you know they're managing many machines and they all log in as you know user X or root or admin, and so any operations on the system, you really don't know who did what. And maybe you've got some other system like a bastion that records it and tells you, but you have to glue these things together um, to figure out who did what. That's not ideal. At AWS, we prefer to have um, you know, personalized accounts and make sure that every action is attributable to the system or human that uh, triggered that action. Um, roles are great at this because roles can be assumed and you keep track of who assumed the role and so on. Uh, and you can trace the whole system end to end. So that's a really, really important property for us. We wanna make sure we always have that. Um, you get that by default uh, with our identity and access systems, um, which, is, which is nice. Uh, I'd say for many, many of our customers who are new to the cloud, um, something we tell them is, oh, if you don't do anything else, do enable um, AWS CloudTrail and AWS Config because those, uh, if anything ever happens, whether it's a security event or an operational mistake, they're gonna be really helpful in, ha in, in allowing you to reconstruct just what happened and so you can undo uh, whatever the issue was. Super, super useful. Um, if we have other forms of detective controls too, uh, things like guard duty, which can help monitor systems, running systems, and VPC traffic mirroring, you know, if you wanna monitor live running traffic and so on. Um, you can get all, all the way into, do, into doing that. Um, CloudTrail is uh, just immensely rich in terms of um, uh, what it can monitor. Uh, I actually set up a fresh account um, last week to try this out and it uh, literally took me about five clicks, including logging into the console, to be able to get to a state where I've got my management events and data events um, being recorded uh, so that I actually, you know, if anything ever happened to that account, anything was ever calling a service and so on, um, I, I would know what and why, uh, which is a really, really great uh, form of um, immutable accountability. The um, internally at AWS, so for calls between our systems, you know, when we've got system A calling system B uh, on a customer's behalf, inside AWS, we're actually using all of these same systems. We use our own SIGV4 protocol. We're calling services just like external actors do. And that access is mediated by principles, roles, policies, um, all of those things that uh, customers can use. That is how we're generally calling ourselves. Um, that means we can put can transparency and consent front of center. Uh, we can be uh, really transparent with the operations that services are making between um, each other. And in, in many cases, uh, customers can even revoke that access and deliberately break it if they have any concerns or any reasons to do that. Uh, we document all of this in um, our AWS managed policies. Uh, if you go through the AWS documentation for service, like here I've got elastic load balancing, you know, you'll find um, not just details of what the managed policy can do. So that's the set of permissions that you know, a service is allowed to use when it's calling another service. Uh, but we even publish the changes uh, with a change log and try to explain you know, why uh, this new operation is needed and so on and so forth. 
And that's just kind of an example of how we're regularly baselining and reviewing everything. And then, you know, try, trying to be really public with what's going on so that everything um, can be accountable. Uh, if you are, um, when you look at a managed policy, you know, you get a big set of permissions and, and privileges and so on um, of what it does. That can be quite intimidating unless you're, a, you know, uh, a, a deep expert on IAM and, and, uh, and what privileges uh, do what and so on. Uh, so a tool I like to recommend folks use is um, Access Analyzer, which is built on um, a combination of automated reasoning and machine learning, uh, mathematical modeling that we have that can take things like a, a policy and a set of privileges and help you analyze what does that really mean? Like what has access to what, right? Because that's, what uh, that's what I really need to know. And it can give you like a, a view from the perspective of like, well, who has access to what? And also the opposite, right? Like you can also look at, well, give me a what, like an S3 bucket and so on, and tell me who can access it or what systems can access it and so on. And these, um, I actually, I recommend that tool is almost like your first stopping point if you've got any um, operations or questions that are IAM related. That's a great first uh, stop because if you explore and learn how to use that tool, it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, but together, right, that means we can get um, pretty simple statements that are, I think, digestible um, that tell you, okay, how, how locked down is this system? Who has access to what? And so on. And, and that gets us to level three, right? That kind of approach and that kind of thinking. And um, in general, at this point, I'd say, you know, levels one, two, and three um, are kind of, I don't wanna say you get them for free in a cloud environment, but they're pretty easy to achieve in a cloud environment. Uh, it's pretty easy to, to enable CloudTrail, for example, right? Or, and, or use systems like I am or systems manager and so on to access systems like with a relatively small amount of effort, essentially any AWS customer can, can get to uh, level three on these systems. Uh, and that's, you know, as true for us as it is for customers. Um, I don't, you know, that's not as easy in on-prem environments and so on, especially on the accountability side. Um, where those kinds of audit trails and so on just don't 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 tend to be common, but that tends to be the kind of starting line um, uh, for a lot of customers, especially after uh, applying a relatively minimal amount of effort. The next levels are where things get a bit more sophisticated and a bit more intricate, and where you know you tend to prioritize the prioritize the environments um, that. I have the most risk or the most data sensitivity or whatever it is. And this is where things can start to demand a bit more um, specialized effort. And they're contingent authorization and hermetic systems. And so the idea with contingent authorization is that, you know, it's not enough to just say, well, system A needs to be able to call system B, right? Or person A needs to be able to do something on behalf of person B and so on. And with contingent authorization, we want any access that's used to be highly specific and conditional, right? We want that access granted only really truly because it's needed, while it's needed, and we want systems that prove that. And sometimes like we mean prove that in like a mathematical and cryptographic sense, right? We want really, really strong security there. So I'll give you an example, some examples of how we've built contingent authorization into our systems. So um, let's, we're gonna look at how ELB uh, accesses um, your SSL certificate key, right? So ELB is Elastic Load Balancers. Customers spin them up, they host websites or applications, and those need SSL certificates. But SSL certificates are stored in uh, the certificate management service, ACM. Um, so how do they get from ACM to ELB, right? So you, we could have built it so that ELB just has, you know, some special call to ACM. Hey, give me, you know, person wise certificate. I mean, you could build it like that, but that is not how we built it and would not be compatible uh, with contingent authorization. So first, the calls between ELB as a service and ACM use the SIGV4 protocol. 
Now, if you want um, some more detail on how SIGV4 works internally, I give a really deep post uh, on my blog about this. You can just search for it, or uh, the URL is right there. But there's things going on inside the SIGV4 protocol itself that are designed to make even the use of that protocol itself include, um, include uh, some contingent authorization. So um, when ELB is accepting a request or a signed request from a customer, so when you call ELB and say, I'd like to create a load balancer, I'd like to associate this certificate with that load balancer, you know, the ELB service has to authenticate that request. It offloads that to the IAM service, right? That's their identity and access management service. And that service validates the signature by, by looking at, you know, was it signed with the correct key, right? But that signing key, it's not just the customer's secret key. It's not just the secret credential that you get, you know, whenever you set up an AWS account uh, or role. Instead, it's a key that is derived from that. And it's derived, it's a new one every single day for every service, for every region. So that key is highly, highly specific, right? And it means if there was some kind of security issue or software defect in that authentication pipeline, or say the ELB service, that at worst, the only key that might be at issue is this per day, per service, per region key, right? So highly, highly, highly scoped. It's really well restricted down. Uh, we actually also have a version of SIGV4 that uses asymmetric cryptography, so it can do this with public-private keys instead. Uh, and in that case, there's, there's nothing except your public key involved. Um, so that key is highly, highly scoped. But then we go even further, and we say, okay, so you made that call to ELB, which your per service, per day, per region key, that's all ELB gets to know. Well, now ELB has to call ACM, right? Now, as I was saying, one obvious way of doing that might be, well, ELB just has an account that's allowed call ACM, and ACM just trusts ELB and says, oh yeah, you, you want certificate Y for account Y? Okay, well, I trust you. We all work at AWS, you know, that's allowed. That is, again, not how it works. Instead, that call uses something called forward, forward access sessions, PAS, we call it internally. And that, though, the way that works is when you call ELB and you say, I want to associate my certificate with um, this low bouncer, I am knows that this is a special call, and I am gives ELB a special time-limited token, cryptographic token, and says, okay, you can use this token, but only for a very short period of time, um, to then access ACM and create a KMS grant that's going to grant you access to that key. And, and you're, that's the only way you're going to get access to that key. So ELB has to prove to ACM and KMS that it actually got an authenticated call from the customer, right? Even though these are trusted services, part of AWS, um, we still want that contingency. We still want that um, cryptographic proof involved. And, um, and it gives us a lot of peace of mind that again, if there's a software defect or some kind of security issue that could lead you know, to some, some kind of problem in that system, that there's no material sitting around, there's no sensitive jackpot key that could just be used to fetch material from KMS and so on. Um, and that's very much at the core of how we think about um, uh, contingent access, there, or contingent authorization, sorry. I have more examples of this. You know, we use the same approach when we're doing things like um, granting EC2 access to be able to use an Amazon EBS encryption key or um, launching AWS private link endpoints. So when a service needs to launch a private, a private link endpoint, it needs to be able to create some routes and some subnets maybe in your VPC or attaching VPC transit gateways and so on. We like to use this pattern uh, wherever we can. Uh, we also apply contingent authorization to how we think about, well, what should be able to access systems, right? So, you know, we have far too many systems and servers, instances uh, to manage by hand. It's just not practical at our scale. Um, and so we have automation and tools 
that can do things that need to be done to those systems, like applying updates or patching and so on. And those systems get vetted and pre-approved, and we have attestation processes that ensure that, you know, that, that tool, that system um, does not access or disclose data. So it's allowed access the system. So, you know, it can maybe apply a software patch or whatever and so on. And that's another form of contingent authorization that we apply. It's that the tool is allowed to have access. That specific tool, because we've vetted it and because we've attested, doesn't access any data. And that's the only way it can have access. It's not that it just gets to like SSH in and do whatever it needs to do and so on. And we are able to enforce, you know, multi-person review and approval and so on and those things. And then we also, because you might have unplanned events or emergencies that mean, well, we didn't plan for this. So we don't know what we need to do in advance. We can't just have a tool sitting around that um, solves it. We also have break glass procedures that mean, um, okay, if we do need to, for some reason, get creative on the fly, and access systems to be able to make changes as part of helping recovering them from an event or whatever. We have break glass mechanisms that allow us to do that, but also trigger very strong accountability in terms of, okay, well, there's gonna be emergency access, but absolutely everything's gonna get logged and absolutely everything's gonna get reviewed by a very senior human. And we're gonna have um, a very deep and thorough uh, review of this and what went on. Um, and uh, those are pretty important. Um, a lot of those systems are built uh, into how access is tied to attestation. And I'll, I'll give you an example of how to build all that together later. But actually a really flexible way of building this into almost any um, system is with API Gateway. You can actually use a Lambda function as an authorizer, as a custom authorizer. And, uh, and you can have that Lambda function implement contingent authorization. And I've only gone into you know, some examples here, but there's other, other ways where we use contingent authorization. Like a non-security way we can use it actually is to say, you know, if a person is doing some software patching or deployments, make sure that they're, they can only do it in one availability zone at a time, which we enforce for availability reasons, right? Because we would never want to impact multiple availability zones um, at once. So it ends up being a, a useful operational tool as well as, well as a security tool. All right, so that's contingent auth. Um, and then the highest level of our system is hermetic systems. So you heard me mention that earlier in terms of these are systems which handle material that is sensitive enough that we build them in a way where there's just no general purpose or operator access at all. Sometimes that's because that's how we've built it from day one. Sometimes it's because we've ratcheted up things to help have a system achieve that level over time. Um, these systems generally have to incorporate some kind of secure route of trust so that we can bootstrap these systems and have the system verify that you know only the correct software is running and so on. Because if the software doesn't enforce these controls, um, those controls um, don't mean very much. Uh, we've examples of this, these kinds of systems at AWS are the AWS Nitro system and the AWS key management uh, service. KMS, uh, which are both systems. There's no general purpose operator access. No one can just go log into them. No one can just scrape material or, or get anything out of it like that. So they're very hermetic. In fact, with the Nitro system, we built it with physical isolation. So we have dedicated Nitro cards and hardware uh, that are separate from the hardware that is running customer instances. So the majority of our virtualization, our network and storage virtualization, runs on those Nitro cards, which have their own CPUs, their own memory, you know, separate from the hardware that is running the customer instance. So, you know, never mind not even being able to log in, not having operational access and so on. It goes even further in that, you know, if there's a bug or defect in that stack, in that system, it's not even running on the same piece of hardware. Um, we, uh, on, on our bare metal instance types, that's, that's the whole story. On our virtualized instances, uh, we also run a very thin hypervisor on the, uh, on the hardware that the customer is running, but that hypervisor is incredibly minimal, incredible paranoia, par has incredible paranoia built in and is self-isolating. It actually is isolates itself from customer memory and so on. Um, and, um, when we built the Nitro system, right, what we're, what we're aiming to do is we want the highest levels of protection we can against a very general 
purpose customer need, right? Customers want to use EC2 instances to do almost anything. They're a very general purpose environment. Customers can run, you know, almost any operating system or application that they want on that instance. Uh, and we don't want to be able to see, right? We very much do not want to be able to see what's going on inside that instance. Um, it's, it's, it's not our business. We don't, you know, that's, that's for the customer. Um, the kind of holy grail of, of this, you know, the, the ideally, idealized utopian, you know, goal for, for this uh, um, kind of need uh, is homomorphic encryption, right? So that's where uh, with homomorphic encryption, computing can be done where all of the data is encrypted and all of the operations occur on that encrypted data and it still works out. Um, there are talks here at Reinforce about our approaches to uh, and research and work on homomorphic encryption. It's very much a cool field. I actually love working on it. But you know, the big takeaway is that it is incredibly slow. Uh, homomorphic encryption is not something that you know customers could run real-world applications uh, for the most part on. Uh, it's it's um, it's simply too uh, simply too slow today. So. You know, the next question we asked ourselves is, okay, well, we can't use homomorphic encryption to build, say, the Nitro system or, or host general purpose computing. What about just using regular encryption, right? Why don't we just encrypt the customer memory and, and, and kind of leave it at that? And, uh, and that's uh, an approach we think might be okay for some defense in depth and might be useful as an additional form of isolation, but we don't feel as, as a good form of strong isolation uh, for the customer. And I'll, I'll, I'll try my best to explain the reasons why. So if you take some plain text data, like I have here on the left, and you encrypt it, the idea is it just looks like noise, right? Simple as that. Whoever can see the encrypted data shouldn't be able to see anything about that information, right? But the reality is that data changes. And the way encryption works is when the data changes, so does the encrypted form of that data, right? And so you can tell the data has changed and where, right? So even though it's encrypted, you can see patterns of how the data is changed. Now for data at rest, that, this isn't much of a concern for two reasons. One, the data at rest is at rest. It's not actively changing. So it's not as vulnerable to these kinds of forms of analysis. The second reason is data at rest is typically authenticated includes something like a Mac or, an, or a cryptographic authentication tag. But encryption for computational data typically can't do that. It would just be too slow to be constantly authenticating the data as well as decrypting it and so on. Um, and so when these patterns are visible, it's, it can be easy to infer, oh, well, because this memory region has changed, well, this is the branch of execution that a, a piece of code has gone down or this is the part of a secret key that is being accessed and used, right? And because those patterns can be inferred, encryption just ends up not being that strong a control. Um, the other kind of classic challenge with encryption just for data on a, on a CPU or in use is that CPUs don't operate on encrypted data and, and can't operate on encrypted data. Well, in the CPU registers, the data actually has to be decrypted. And so, uh, if there are side channels or microarchitectural issues uh, in the CPU, those can end up uh, disclosing the data anyway, and you have to consider you know, the CPU's firmware and so on, all part of your trusted computing base. And, um, and that makes us you know, not terribly comfortable. So at AWS Nitro, you know, the way we built the system is our primary and strongest line of defense is that we isolate the memory and we build controls where the memory just simply can't be accessed. Like there's just no way uh, for it to be addressed, whether that's between two EC2 instances or between ourselves and the instance and so on, or even between our own hypervisor and the instance. And then uh, we do use uh, memory encryption, uh, all memories encrypted on our uh, Graviton2 and Graviton3 um, platforms. Uh, but uh, we prefer to think of it as a secondary control or defense in depth. And um, this, you know, for me is a big part of what we think about when we're building hermetic systems. We really want to analyze them in terms of, we really just do not want to be able to see inside those systems. And so we want to be really, really thorough from that. Um, the, 
if you were to look inside the actual server and see what's going on, you'd see this kind of split between what the Nitro system is doing at the bottom, where it's doing network and storage virtualization and so on, uh, and the management, security, and monitoring, and, uh, and everything that the customer is running. We don't have, I'm reiterating this for the third time, but I, I guess I'll belabor it. We don't have any um, general purpose or operational access or anything like that, and that, that's what makes it. But the other thing that makes it hermetic is that every build and everything we do is signed, right? When we're getting software into these systems, it has to be signed, vetted, and attested that it's actually not capable of disclosing data. And, uh, and we have mechanisms to ensure that. And we have, uh, and every operation, every call that's made to a Nitro system, it's by a signed, authenticated, encrypted uh, API and so on. Nitro also runs in an isolated network. We don't have general debugging features uh, and so on. Um, it's, um, it's, it's pretty well locked down. We've made um, some other decisions along the way to get even you know, the highest levels of isolation that we can. Um, a, a good example of that is we don't share CPU cores or L1 or L2 caches and so on between EC2 instances or between instances and ourselves and so on. We really, really, really want to be paranoid about keeping it harmonic. Um, and um, I, I think that makes it um, very effective because it's easier to use. So that's an example of how we achieve um, hermetic access. Uh, but the Nitro system, you know, and KMS, they represent very big investments for us. A lot of engineering time went into building systems that are that sealed off, that can be operated at scale reliably um, without operators needing access, without anybody ever needing to do um, any operations that access customer memory or anything like that. But we also wanted to make it much, much easier for customers to tie all those things together and to be able to build systems themselves uh, for their own um, customer or citizen or end user data that they're hosting. And so Nitro, our take on that is Nitro Enclaves, where hopefully with Nitro Enclaves, uh, what we've been seeing from customers and partners who've been using it in the um, almost two years since we've launched it now, is we, we've made it hopefully you know, very practically easy um, to get all the way to level five and have a hermetic system that handles um, operations on data in a way where the customer's operators no longer have access to that data. And the idea with Nitro Enclaves is you know, delivering all the benefits of the Nitro system in a kind of recursive way, where now the customer can get all those benefits. And the model is, you know, the customer gets to choose and run an EC2 instance. They can pick any size or type as long as it's got a you know, minimum number of CPU cores, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but it's really flexible. Any of our instance types that use Nitro, just run and launch one. And then from that instance, they can launch an enclave. And what happens under the hood is that the Nitro enclave creates a virtual machine, a dedicated, isolated virtual machine just for that enclave. And those, uh, that virtual machine and that enclave environment is highly, highly isolated. It's a hermetic system by default. It's got no durable storage. It's got no network access. It's got no interactive access. And it's got none of the regular EC2 services like the metadata service or DNS or NTP. It is walled off, closed down. It is like you know, having a, an old school server at the other end of a serial cable, effectively. And that serial cable is um, what's called a virtual socket or a VSOC, and that's the only way in or out. And that VSOC is connected between the EC2 instance that launched the Enclave and the enclave. And then we've got helper agents that can manage um, communications across and into that enclave using end-to-end -end, um, encrypted communications that use um, cryptographic attestation. And so you can get data into and out of the enclave using SSL or um, TLS or using message level encryp encryption and so on. But either way, the instance that launched it any operators that are logged into that instance, anybody who has to manage it, they can't decrypt that, they can't see what's going on. 
And this all works because we can bootstrap from the attestation and the Nitro um, secure root of trust. The way it works is you build your application to run inside that enclave. You can actually build it to run inside a container and then there's an easy way to take a container definition and turn it into an enclave. And um, that application can do whatever you like. It can be in any programming language you want. You get a full virtual machine. So it can run any base operating system, any, um, any application. We wanted this to be very general purpose, very, very usable. Um, and when that application starts, you have it generate a local public private key pair. Um, the private key never leaves the enclave, lives and dies with that enclave, forever unknown, just locked away securely inside that hermetic environment. But the enclave the, or the application running inside the enclave can ask the Nitro system, hey, I need you to you know, do some attestation for me. And it supplies its public key and additionally, or optionally, um, a nonce, which is just a number used once. If, in some protocols, that's important if you want to make sure things can't be duplicated, um, to the Nitro attestation service. And the Nitro attestation service will hand back an attestation document. And it basically asserts, OK, I have run this cryptographic checksum of the Enclave environment. And here's what I think you are. Here's your checksum. Here's everything I know about you. Here's the instance you were launched on, the time, the region, the AZ, all that kind of stuff, uh, the, the role that was used for the instance that launched you. Uh, here's the checksum of like your boot um, image. Here's the checksum of your application image. All of these things end up inside the, inside the attestation document. And then the public key is in there because the, uh, the application provided it. And the attestation document can then be, that's public material. That can be safely exported outside of the enclave. And that can be used to get anything you want into the enclave. Right? Anything external can just look at that attestation document and go, well, if I trust this checksum, or if I trust this signing key, I'm good. I know that's really the application. Uh, I, I trust it to do only safe operations um, with that material. So I'm going to encrypt some material using that public key and send it into the enclave and only the enclave can decrypt it and we're good. And that's kind of, that's what's going on in the Nitro system. Just we've made that possible um, for, for customers. And you get a really truly hermetic system with that kind of design. You've got cryptographic attestation of the actual software that's running. So you know it's the actual software that you trust that only doesn't save operations. And you've got cryptographic end-to-end -end protection of everything going in or out. Um, and so you get all the way to level five. You can have a system that is, you know, built in the most paranoid way for the most paranoid movie plot level threats um, and able to get there with Nitro Enclaves. That is all the levels. Um, we got through a lot there. Some things I just want to emphasize very quickly are, um, I'd say, Something we've learned along our journey of kind of applying this framework and ratcheting up security levels over time across AWS has been um, emphasizing more and more just building consensus and collaboration in our business as we ratchet up those levels to make sure that we're not making things too inconvenient for operators, not having things backfire by you know locking systems down so hard so quickly that um, they can't get anything done. Um, because that's not an effective outcome either. You know, we want to make sure this goes hand in hand with building automation at a scalable pace um, so that everything, um, everything uh, goes as, as well and as quickly as it really can without any setbacks. Um, and that um, enabling CloudTrail and Config are probably the biggest, quickest, easiest wins um, for most AWS customers. Reducing privileges. Um, if you become an access analyzer, power user, that be becomes a, a, a real power tool. Uh, I've seen many, many customers get a lot of benefit from that just by applying, you know, relatively um, a small amount of, you know, just a few hours even of, of learning how to use that tool can just pay off in, a, in an absolutely massive way. And then if you're handling sensitive data, if you've got data sets that, you know, if they were breached, it would be a big deal. You know, I, I think it's really important to try to push towards building hermetic systems, systems that just no one ever has access to the data or would ever need to have access to the data. And I think it's increasingly doable and we're going to be together making it easier and easier. Um, 
if this framework is useful to you, if you think this is kind of a useful way to analyze systems in your businesses um, or systems or services, uh, let us know because we're keen to learn um, and refine. Uh, and with that, I'll say um, thank you all for coming. I do um, one last thing, which is actually, it's my privilege that this is the last talk of the day on the last day in this room. So I really do want to thank uh, all the folks who've been running AV and everything throughout this conference, um, because I know how hard that is. Thank you all for coming. Great.